I, I want to tell you right now, I am not uh, fixing to pass out. I am not dizzy. I am not sick. I'm okay. But I'm fixing to do something a little unusual, a little unorthodox. But I want to make my point. All right. Whew. That's loud. Go ahead, get through. I'm fixing to make a spectacle of myself. All right. Gravity is working against me. It wants to pull me this way. It wants to pull me this way. It wants to pull me this, that, this way. Okay. You know what I'm going to do? Four letter word. R E S T. What's holding me up? The floor. The floor is good and strong. The floor is holding me up. And I don't care how hard gravity works. It's a good old floor. It stood here a long time. It's helped more people than me. And the floor is holding me completely. I am not exerting one ounce of effort. I am resting. You got that? You do say amen. amen. Alright, I get up. Now I was careful to lay down next to something that I could help get myself up with. Y'all, anybody got to the point that when you go out in the garden you always carry a shovel? Not because you're going to dig a hole, but because you want to put it right there next to you. So you got that shovel to help you get up off your knees. Amen. Amen. I'm going to talk about resting today. We're in Hebrews chapter 4. If you have your Bible, turn there. In the meanwhile, we've got a hymn that I thought was in our hymn book, but it's not. But I had an old hymn book that's got it in it. And I want to read you some of the words from this song. <laughs> These are good. I should have made a slide, but I didn't. Everything being what it is. The title of the song is Jesus. I am risen. Now, the typical Baptist especially one that most people would consider faithful, acts like a driven person. Gotta, 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 gotta. Gotta be there. Uh, you know, sometimes we think that busyness is godliness. And I'm not speaking against actively serving God. I'm not speaking against that at all. But I can tell you this much. I can get more done when I'm resting in Jesus than I can trying to do stuff in my own human effort. And when it comes to the subject of eternal life, when it comes to the subject of your personal salvation, whether your sins are ever going to be forgiven, whether you are ever going to enter heaven's gate, has nothing to do with your energy, your effort, and your hard work only way you'll get in heaven's gate is to rest in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And none of God's people said? Alright, that's better. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what Thou art. I am finding out the greatness of Thy loving heart. You don't find that until you rest in Him. Thou hast bid me gaze upon Thee, and Thy beauty fills my soul. For by Thy transforming power, Thou hast made me whole. Thou hast made me whole. Second verse. Simply trusting Thee, Lord Jesus, I behold Thee as Thou art. And thy love so pure, so changeless, satisfies my heart. Satisfies its deepest longings. 
meets, supplies its every need, compasseth me round with blessings. Thine is love indeed. The chorus goes, Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what Thou art. I am finding out the greatness of Thy loving heart. If you're not careful this morning, if you don't pay attention, you're going to miss the point of what I'm going to say today. I just want you to know God has a message for us. And the message is the finished work of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to know that in the finished work of the cross is our salvation. And in the finished work of the cross on a daily basis is our sanctification. God does not want His people living out of a position of deficit, always striving, straining, sweating, toiling, weeping, yearning. No, no, no. God wants us to live in abundant life. And we spoke about that a few weeks ago. Jesus said, I came that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. Understand me that if you could have fullness, if you could have wholeness, if you could have abundance outside of Jesus Christ, He would not have come. He would have not suffered the cross. I'm telling you what He did. And what He did when He did what He did. What He accomplished is not only wonderful and glorious and marvelous, but it is essential. I've got to read the first verses of the a song across from it. This is in our hymn book. But it goes along with what we're speaking on this morning. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take Him at His Word just to rest upon His promise just to know thus saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus how I trust Him how I've proved Him o'er and o'er Jesus, Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust Him Second verse you got to hear. You probably know it. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood. Plus nothing, minus nothing. I added that. Just in simple faith to plunge me beneath the healing, cleansing flood. Take your Bible and turn there to Hebrews chapter 4. I think that uh, Hebrews chapter 4 is so key to the entire book. I mean, what part of the book can you do without none? None. It's a, it's a glorious gift from God. It is complete as He gave it. You don't have to add to it. You certainly shouldn't take away from it. But if I were to choose a section that is so essential it would be this particular one. We, we do understand of the superiority of Jesus to uh, the prophets and His superiority to the angels and His superiority to Moses and to Joshua. His superiority of, of all things. We're going to find out how He has a, a superior priesthood. He has a more superior covenant. He is a more superior sacrifice for sin. But all of that will avail us nothing if we can't come to the place that we will simply trust Him. And may I give you a little hint here? You are not trusting in Him if you are not resting in Him. I don't think this weighs over 10 pounds. I'm restricted to picking up 10 pounds or less. 
I trust that chair. That's a good chair. That chair holds Brother Lee up and his guitar. It's a good chair. I'm not trusting in that chair until I am resting in that chair. Now don't get me wrong. You know, Baptists are evenly divided between them that are workaholics and them that are sorry and useless and lazy. <laughs> it, is, it is well known that 20% uh, of the church does 80% of the work. That's, that's well known. Unfortunately, we sort of perpetuate that situation because we keep those hard-working people uh, well, you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. Somebody told them along the way, well, you got to add to your salvation. No, you don't have to add to your salvation one thing. What happens is when you rest in Jesus, He works out His works in you and through you. And you do it by faith. And you do it by love. And you have joy in the service and not with grief. And as the writer of Hebrews says, that is unprofitable for you. When you live in the constant grief of deficit feeling, I got to do something to earn God's favor. Honey child, do you know the definition of grace? Grace means unmerited favor. And in case you don't know the definition of that fancy word merited, unmerited favor means it is undeserved. You don't deserve it. You have never deserved it. And you, are you ready for this? Will never deserve it. That's why grace is so amazing. Because God chose in His large heart to love the unlovely and to reach out to the untouchable and to do for them what no one else could do and they could not do for themselves. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You know what a wretch is? A, a wretch is a person who's in a world of hurt and cannot help themselves to get out of it. The word wretched particularly means not just being in a pickle, but you can't get out of the jar. You have no means within yourself to stop that problem. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 7, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this sinful condition? Basically, I'm paraphrasing. Who shall deliver me? I'm a wretched man. And wretched means I can't fix it. It is broken and I do not and I will not ever have the means to do this. And this is why grace is so amazing because God has chosen to do what we don't deserve, what we cannot do. And He has done it because He has in a sense held His nose and reached down to smelly creatures like us. My wife's brother, when he was little, found what he called a pretty kitty in the woods one day. It was particularly pretty because it had the blackest black with the prettiest white stripes across his back and up its tail. You, you, you going where I'm going with this? It was a youngin, but the youngin still had the capacity to be a real stinker, you know? It was a skunk. But he carried it home to Mama Kay and said, Look, Mommy, pretty kitty. Now, you know, at that point, my, my mother in law, Miss Arley, had a choice to make. Do I bury the child or do I just bury his clothes? She showed him grace. There was nothing about him at that moment that endeared him to her. She had a hard time getting close. 
I wasn't there. You weren't there. He was uh, your older brother. This was told to you. But your mother verified the story. I, I think that she did not even help him off with his clothes. He suffered the embarrassment. Of course, he was a little guy. He suffered the embarrassment of removing his clothes outside. And I think she took the water hose to him first before she brought him into the bathtub. We got to understand how unappealing we are to God. And how, how that God has done for us a marvelous thing just even considering us. May I tell you, when we read the warnings in the book of Hebrews, we need to take them to heart. Now in the fourth chapter, we're going to look at what I would call the third warning. Some scholars like to call it a continuation of the second warning. I don't really care. That's just theological jargon. Uh, anything that looks like a warning is a warning, and you should take it as a warning. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Let us therefore fear. Now you know, 365 times at least in the Bible, it says do not fear or fear not. One for, one for every day of the week, uh, every, every day of the year. But in this particular case, you need to be scared. You need to be afraid. In other words, what He's fixing to warn us not to do should scare us so much that we take His warning to heart. And, and He says, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left to us, uh, of us entering into His rest, there's that word rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. Now, the them that's being spoken of here in chapter 4 refers back to the folks in chapter 3. The people who didn't enter into the promised land. The reason they didn't enter into the promised land is because they didn't trust God. And God said, y'all are going to die in the desert. We're going to take another lap around Mount Sinai for 40 years until all you guys are dead. Your kids are going to go in, but you're not going in. Only Joshua and Caleb were the exception to that. And they had the gospel preached to them. They came short of it. The gospel was preached as well as unto them. It was to us. But the word preached unto them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Now, we're going to go back to that. Let's keep reading. For we which have believed do enter. That's in that a tense of the verb. We have entered. We're continuing to enter. We are uh, people who are on the other side. We're there. We, we've entered. We who do enter. Why? Because we believed. What do we enter into? What, what's the word there? Say it again. Say it again. Say it loudly. I know y'all need a day off. You sorry workaholics. You got all of them off. <laughs> For we which have believed do enter into that rest. I want you to see the obvious repetitive connection between believing and resting. Believing and resting. If you are believing, you're resting. And if you're resting, it's because you have believed. And they are inseparable. They are cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. There's a choice involved. The choice is not to rest. We want to enter into the rest of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, the rest of Jesus is sweet. Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. This is in John chapter 11. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Now that sounds like a contradiction. Rest, but put the yoke on you. But he says, take my yoke upon me, upon you and learn of me. 
for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The first time my wife and I did a four day backpacking trip on the Appalachian Trail, I carried a 75 pound pack. And I think she carried a 45 or 50 pound pack. <laughs> that yoke was not easy and that burden was not light. The second time we took a trip on the Appalachian Trail for, I think it was four nights with Nancy, uh, I carried a 50 pound pack. That's a 25 pound reduction. And I think she carried about 35 pounds. Understandably so. She's petite and I'm humongous. And so that's appropriate. That's a proportion. And I want you to know, a 55 pound pack on my back is not a problem for me. And I can go uphill and downhill all day long at my pace. Now, I'm not talking about marathon pace. I'm talking about my pace. Jesus is saying, my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. So to take His yoke upon you, to trust in Him, to enter into fellowship and into covenant with Him, there's, there's responsibility. There's uh, things to do. You know, people get the idea when you get to heaven, we're going to just sit around on fluffy looking clouds and eat cream cheese on crackers. Those stupid commercials. I don't like them because I, I don't even know there's going to be cream cheese in heaven. I, you know, come on. But that's not, we are going to do, yeah, well, some of y'all say, oh, it wouldn't be heaven without cream cheese. All right, for you, they'd probably be cream cheese, you know. I don't know about chocolate. I don't know about devil's food. I don't know. But it, we'll find out. We'll find out. We're going to be busy in heaven. But we're going to shuck this old carnal nature. This thing that says, I have to do. I have to achieve. I have to get credit. I have to do stuff that will bring me glory. We'll shuck all that stuff. We'll live for the glory of Jesus. And we'll live out of the super abundance. Remember what Jesus said? He said that those who trust in Him, not only will they uh, drink of the, a stream of living water, but He said, out of their bellies shall flow rivers of living water. Do you know how much effort there is to get water out of an artesian well? How I many of you know what an artesian well is? Anybody know what an artesian well is? It's a well that when you drill it, you better plug it quick because it's going to spit in your face as soon as you tap the mother load of water. It has pressure of its own and it just comes out of the ground. I remember a, a, an artesian well over by Green, Green Cove Springs down in Florida. And I want you to know it's a big old well. And brother, it has a big old cap on it. And they water their cattle with it. All they have to do is put a valve on it, turn it on and off. It flows all by itself. When the life of Jesus comes within us, He's the power. He's the life. He's the strength. He's the motivation. <coughs> and for the believer, it's resting. By the way, those of you who hadn't been here, I had surgery. They fixed my pain. I'm pain free. Got a weird scar on the back of my head, but that's cool. It's all right. A war wound, yeah. Uh, I want you to know, and I don't want to keep saying this, but it just it's significant. It's a lesson I learned. There are times when I stood in this pulpit to preach, and I've never felt the intensive pain like I felt when I tried to preach. Because when I moved my mouth, it aggravated the nerve. And the nerve would get all lit up, and it would just get worse and worse that entire time I preached. But I want you, I say all this to say this. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Like Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I want you to know, 10 or 15 minutes into preaching, it would just... It would still hurt. It would hurt more. But I didn't care. And I was resting in the grace of God to do what He called me to do. Now listen to me. I was not thanking God for that experience while I was going through it. I, I'm honest. I'm a, I'm a bush leaguer. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not a major leaguer. I don't bat in the big leagues yet. Because I thank God for my trials after they're over like you do but I am thanking God for that trial because I had the opportunity to face the most miserable painful thing I ever had in my life 
and experience joy so great at the same time of the privilege of preaching the Word of God that the pain paled in insignificance. I don't understand it. But I think it's really cool that in whatever circumstance you face, you can rest in Him and He will empower you to do it. Now i got to get to my point because my time is going away. Back to verse 3. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As He said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall not enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. Uh, God did rest on the seventh day from all his works. And in this place, again, if they shall enter into my rest. Again, that was his condition. Verse 6, seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limits a certain day, saying in David, which is, happens to be Psalm 95, verse 7 through 11. If you want to write that down and read it, 11, read it later, Psalm 95, uh, verse 7 through 11. Today, after so long a time as it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Joshua, some versions say Jesus, and that's simply because the name Joshua and Jesus are exactly the same word in the Hebrew. And, and, they, and, and it's, uh, trust me, it's Joshua because the context declares it plainly. Every scholar I can find agrees with that. They, they that know the language better than I do. For if Joshua had given them rest, and here again, those that did believe and didn't drop dead in the desert, but Joshua then picked up where Moses left off and he literally led them into the promised land, but they didn't enter fully into rest. And, and David is saying this in Psalm 95, uh, for if Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? You see, Joshua said, yeah, we're going to the promised land, but this is, there's, there's something else coming. There's the true rest that you can enter into one day. And, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about Jesus and what He came to do. Verse 9, the conclusion, there remains therefore. Anytime you see a therefore, it's, it's because of what is said before it. There remains therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, that is the rest of Jesus Christ, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. There after the sixth day of creation, God took the seventh day off. He rested. He was done creating. And when we enter into the rest of Jesus Christ, the finished work of Christ on the cross, then we do enter into our rest. There is no need to seek to earn God's favor because you just entered into the fullness of God's favor. Listen to me carefully. From the foundation of the world, God who sees past, present, and future all equally clearly, all at the same time, loved you as much as He could have ever loved you. When you were born, God loved you as much as He could ever love you. When you lived as a jerk, making bad choices, God hated what you did, but God loved you as much as He ever could love you. And today, and tomorrow, and for eternity, God already loves you as much as He can love you. And you say, I don't understand how that works. Remember, it's because of His grace. He has set His favor on you. He has set His affection on you. Jesus says we have that same capacity. He said, set your affection on things above. Don't set your affections on things below. So to love is a, a, a choice to assign our affections to whatever we want to assign our affections to. 
spoke to a woman last week. She has set her affection on a man that physically abuses her. I tried to explain to her, lady, God didn't make you to be a punching bag. And I said, if you tell me, I'm going to report it. She says, then I won't tell you. And she alternately tried to talk about how much hurt she was enduring and how much that it was okay that the person really wasn't a bad person. And I thought, how scary to set your affection on a walking, talking, broken heart. All she's ever going to have being an enabler for this person is a torn up, broken heart, and possibly a broken body and life. Boy, that's a downer. But we have the power to set our affection. We are made in the image and the likeness of God. God chose to set His affection on a bunch of losers. He wants to make us winners. He has loved us while we were losers. God commanded His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. You see, those who believe enter into such a rest that they have the peace of God that passes all understanding. And they can live life resting, trusting, being at peace. I know to some of you, you say, oh, that's a pretty story, preacher, but that's not real. Oh, it's real. Let me finish reading. I'll go back to 9. There remains therefore a rest to the people of God for he that is entered into his rest. He also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. Lest any man fall after the example of unbelief. Now quickly let me remind you of the, the two warnings we've already looked at. The first warning was in chapter 2. It says don't neglect so great a salvation. It says, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angel is steadfast, every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Remember, he's talking to people who have begun to follow Jesus, but they hadn't been through the door yet. They're following on the fringe. They're making up their mind whether they're going to trust Him or not. And He's saying, look, don't let it slip. Don't put this off. Because how are you going to escape if you neglect so great a salvation? The second warning is uh, in chapter 3. And this is the warning again. It's, they're, they're, they're very closely related. This warning says that you should not come short of partaking of Christ because of your unbelief. You see, again, He's, he's, the idea, the theme of the book of Hebrews is speaking to, speaking to people who are getting ready to go back to Judaism. They've started following Jesus, but they're not, they're not believers yet. They haven't crossed through the door. They haven't been born again yet. They haven't secured their eternal life by receiving Christ Jesus yet. And he says in verse 12 of chapter 3, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Again, he's talking to people who have never embraced Him fully. They're kind of moving in that direction. Kind of like a lot of Baptists. They join the church, they get baptized, but they, don't, they never trusted Him. He says, verse 14, he clarifies, For we are made partakers of Christ if... That's an important if. We hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. He's not talking to the end of your life. He's talking to the end of the goal. The Greek word is teleos, which means the completion of the goal. If you hold fast the beginning of your salvation to the point that you actually believe and receive and confess Christ in genuine saving faith. And he's warning them. Don't stop short with an evil heart of unbelief. And so this third warning we're reading to you in chapter 4. 
He's saying, don't come short of entering into His rest. Basically, all three warnings are saying the same thing. You guys are fans. But you're not team members. You're followers. But not possessors of Christ. Because people who believe in Jesus rest. I've told you my testimony countless times. It's my favorite story. I'll tell it all eternity. The night that I finally understood that Jesus Christ died for my sins and rose from the dead, that He paid my price on the cross. That's why He died. He did it because He loved me. Like Paul says, the love of Christ constrains us. The Holy Spirit didn't grab me and drag me down the aisle. The Holy Spirit touched my heart with the depth of the mercy and the love of God. My heart was saying, Wow! He really loves me! He wants me! I could have floated down that aisle, but I walked. I knelt to receive Christ as my Savior. And I confessed with my mouth the Lord Jesus. And I believed in my heart that God raised Him from the dead. I rested. I'd spent a year trying to find out who God was. In the process, I figured out who the real God was. He was the God of this book. Because as I read that book, that book was reading me. And showing me the way. And I tried to change my life. I tried to quit smoking, tried to quit drinking, tried, tried to quit using drugs, tried, tried to quit cussing, tried to quit doing this. I tried so hard. This is why rest is so appealing. If you care about God, if you care about the things of God, you want to live righteously because He's a holy God. He's got a high standard. But the only way that we can ever meet His high standard is to enter into the finished work of Jesus so that His righteousness can be put on our account, making us acceptable to God. Listen, the Bible says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. And when I prayed to receive Christ, literally heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now I didn't stop desiring to live righteously, but I stopped laboring. I started resting. And I began, I went home and poured out all the alcohol that I had in the house. Threw away every, all the illicit things in my house. I stopped cussing that day. I got a heart transplant that day. Now, I'm not boasting. I was a jerk and a fool and I tried for over a year to change any of it. And I couldn't change any of it. But when I entered into the rest of Jesus Christ simply by Faith. He changed me. And I'm resting. Oh, am I still a work in progress? Obviously. I may not drink, smoke, or cuss, but I'm still a jerk at times. Needs adjustment. Need the valves ground. Need the distributor replaced. You know, I'm, I'm a work in progress. But you see, I am His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. He is working His works in me. You know what I'm doing? 
Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what Thou art. I am finding out the greatness of Thy loving heart. Resting. Resting. Now I ask you this morning. Have you been through that door? Are you resting in Him? <laughs>